Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, we'll be putting a handle on a vintage spatula. So, a uh, spatula, huh? Well, let's talk about this a little bit. This is going to be a nice, simple project, and you can use some of the same procedures to put uh, a handle on a knife that you would uh, on many kitchen utensils or other tools around the shop. So, even if your main interest is in making knives, uh, there should be plenty of information here that would be useful to you if you want to replace the handle on an existing knife. Now, one of the great pleasures of making things is being able to make gifts for your family. Uh, my mom owns this spatula that she was given by her mother, and not only does it have sentimental value to her, but she actually likes using it better than all these new spatulas that she's bought over the years. She estimates that this spatula is actually 70 years old. So, uh, at long last, the handle's coming off, and she wondered if I could make a new one. Well, I could hardly refuse. Uh, she taught me to cook, and I've been using this very spatula since I was, I don't know, five, six, seven years old. So, kind of a fun little project, and one that has a lot of meaning within my family. So, as mom remembers it anyway, this spatula was given to her mom by her mom's aunt in about 1946. The brand of the spatula is Maid of Honor, which uh, according to my research was the kitchen brand of, the, of Sears, starting somewhere around 1946. So that kind of accords with, um, with her memory of, of when her mom got the spatula originally. <laughs> All right, enough talk. Let's begin by taking off the old handle. After 70 years, the Made in USA rivets are finally given out. Well, one of them is. The other one looks like it could hang on until the century mark. But it's time to go. So I'll grind off the old rivets on my belt grinder and just pull them out. Interestingly enough, I find that underneath are holes for three pins or rivets, despite the fact that there are only two used. I think I'm going to use all three of them. Now I've chosen to replace the handle with this piece of rosewood. Much of the world's rosewood supply is now on the endangered list, so it's harder to find, but I got this ages ago, back when they were still exporting rosewood from Brazil. Brazilian rosewood is among the most beloved woods used by makers of musical instruments, but for this project, if you want to do something similar, any old wood will do. I personally prefer oily woods like rosewood for tool handles for reasons I'll explain later, but if you want to duplicate this, you can use any old wood that comes to hand. All right, so before we jump into doing the actual work itself, just a general note for those of you who don't have, you know, really super well-equipped shops. Virtually everything that we'll do today is something that can be done with really simple hand tools. Um, in this case, uh, we're gonna split the wood on my band saw, but you could just as easily do this with any old hand saw. Next, I'll take it to my disc grinder to flatten my handle scales. You could tape a piece of heavy grit sandpaper to a piece of glass or some other very flat surface, masonite, something like that maybe, and accomplish the same thing I'm doing here. The goal is just to get it dead flat so that when you attach it to the spatula's tang, there'll be zero gaps between the wood and the metal. Now let me talk about using disc grinders. Disc grinders are great for flattening things, but there are a lot of little peculiarities to them that you need to be aware of. First, safety. Disc grinders will grab hold of things and throw them if you're not careful. So you always want to support them here on the table where the disc's rotation pushes the material down into the table rather than over on the other side where it's gonna fling them. You'll also see me use this section here supporting the corner on the table. So why move it from one place to the other? Well, the tiniest variation in the wear of the abrasive disc that is attached to the face of the disc grinder 
you know, a slightly loose portion of the disc, some stretching, bubbling. There are a whole bunch of things that can cause the disc to not grind quite flat in certain areas. So by rotating the material to various parts of the grinder, you can even out even very tiny inconsistencies in the disc. If you don't do this, the scales will dish out in the middle or they'll run high on the ends. You know, something will go out of true and you'll end up with something that's not quite flat. Likewise, if you put too much pressure using your fingers on either the ends or the middle of the scale, since the scale's relatively flexible, you can cause the same kinds of unevenness. So, I avoid pressing too hard, and I keep moving it around, as you'll see, flipping it over, moving it to different sections of the disc, and so forth. Also, you can overheat the wood, causing it to warp or burn. Even if it doesn't burn, sometimes it can warp. So I go back and forth between the two scales, allowing the wood to cool as I work. I could do this faster if I just jammed it in there and blasted away as hard as humanly possible. But if I do that, I'm going to cause myself a lot of problems, so i got to go take it nice and easy. As I'm grinding, I'll check the flatness against the machinist's square. But you can also hold the two pieces together up to a light and see if light shows through any gaps. Once everything's nice and flat, I'll drill the holes. Now in this instance I'm using a drill press, but you could use anything from a mill down to a hand drill or even an old brace and bit. This is not complicated, it's not difficult, it's something anybody can do with very simple tools. Now the existing holes in this spatula are a hair over one eighth of an inch, but I want to go a little bigger, three sixteenths. I'll cut my pins from three sixteenths inch brass stock using a hacksaw. Now the reason for cutting them now, as opposed to just waiting until the very end, is that I'm going to use them as slave pins to assure that everything lines up when I'm drilling all these holes. Now there are a million ways to pin or rivet a handle, and I'm using just the most absolutely dead simple approach here. Frankly, this is less durable than riveting. Will these pins last another 70 years? Probably not. But I'd give them a few decades so I'm not too worried. I'll start off by using a spade bit to enlarge the holes. A spade bit is kind of a specialized bit that's less likely to grab the thing and spin it around or to grab an edge and make an off-center hole than a standard twist drill is. There's really no big need for me to do this, but you know, I've got the bit, so why not? Now after I've enlarged the holes in the tang, I'll bring my scales over and drill them one side at a time using the slave pins I mentioned earlier to assure that everything's properly aligned. You can watch the sequence here and you'll see what I'm doing. The reason for this is that if you don't do it this way, you're liable to get holes that won't line up. Then you won't be able to get your handle attached. The pins just won't go through the holes correctly. So this is a pretty simple process. You just drill, pin, drill again another pin, and then drill the third hole. Once you've got that all set up, you flip it over and reposition the pins, repeating more or less the same process from the other side. The important thing, and this is pretty obvious, is that you want to make sure you drill through the side that you've already drilled. Again, this is just to assure that the pin holes line up.
now I'll trim the excess from the ends of the handle scales. I always make the handle scales a little bigger than necessary. Here's the reason. It's nearly impossible to flatten material even using pretty good technique, you know, doing all the little things that I told you in order to get something nice and flat on the disc grinder. It's still very difficult to absolutely get it dead flat from edge to edge. What tends to happen is that you get a little bit of dishing at the ends, so I'll just trim off those ends. Now that we've trimmed the part that will go at the throat of the spatula, we'll profile that front edge. The reason for doing this now as opposed to waiting to the end is because you can't get at it properly once the wood has been pinned to the handle. This is true of tool handles and it would be true of a, a knife or anything like that, cutting tools also. sanding and here's the result buttery smooth it's just a really beautiful wood you know there's not a real showy grain it's not really fancy wood but boy nice stuff so I'll go ahead and attach the scales with the pins and two-part epoxy Now I'm just using something that I picked up at Home Depot, but there are more expensive industrial grade epoxies. There's specialized knife making epoxy like uh, Blade Bond, but this is what I happen to have at hand and it works just fine. Mix it. Spread it. Clamp it. Then clean the squeeze out up here at the throat. I'm using rubbing alcohol here, just a tiny little bit on a piece of paper towel, but just about any conventional shop solvent will work. As a general rule, I don't like to use the super thin ones like acetone because they tend to wick into the gap there and leach out some of the epoxy. We'll clamp it up and leave it to cure according to the manufacturer's instructions. After the epoxy is cured, I'll grind the handle to shape using an industrial grade belt grinder. Now, do you need a big hog like my Bader B3? You do not. You can use any old cheap belt sander that might be found in a home carpentry shop, or you can do all this with a rasp and a bastard file. Sure, it'll take a little longer, but it's a pretty simple task and it won't take you that long. Now I'm aiming to just mimic the shape of the original handle, so nothing fancy. We'll round off all the edges, flatten it and so on, moving up to various higher grit belts. There's no set formula for when to move from the belt sander to hand sanding, but I took mine to 320 grit on the belt grinder. Some knife makers don't use hand sanding at all and they just go straight from the grinder to a rotary buffer. Whatever works for you. I'll go ahead and smooth everything out with a sanding block at 320 grit. Then I'll use 600 grit. Some of it I'll do by hand, but 
you can use various backing materials like the leather on this vice jaw to help you clean up tricky parts of the handle like the very end. So now that we've got everything cleaned up, the wood feels great in the hand, and we've gotten rid of all the scratches from heavier abrasives that show up on the brass handle pins. I wish you could feel this, it's just silky smooth. I mentioned earlier that I like oily hardwoods for handles. These would include exotics like rosewood, cocobolo, and various other things. The advantage of these hard, oily woods is that they don't require complicated finishes in order to look and feel good. For tools that I'm going to use uh, that are going to get wet probably, that are going to be getting maybe sweat or blood or oils on them, whatever, I don't like using polyurethane varnishes and things of that nature. I don't like the way they feel and eventually they'll blister off and just kind of look crappy. So that's what these kind of oily hardwoods do is they just make it kind of simple on you to, to have something that looks really nice. Now among the disadvantages of many of these kinds of woods is that lots of them are tropical hardwoods and they're difficult to source now as they're often listed as endangered and they're restricted from importation to the US. Now this is great for the rainforest, but it sucks for you and me. Well, it just is what it is. So giving a great polish is as simple as using a basic commercial furniture wax. Letting it sit for a few minutes according to the instructions, and then buffing it out by hand with a paper towel. No lacquer, no varnish, no polyurethane, nothing wax that's it now again a power buffer is an option but frankly it's not necessary with a beautiful wood like this you can do it with a cheap paper towel if you want and here's where we end up ready to head back to the kitchen for another 70 years of flipping hamburgers <laughs> So just to wrap up this project, you know, most of my projects are uh, straight knife making projects, but I mean, there are just millions of tools floating around out there in uh, flea markets. Uh, everybody's got old uh, kitchen implements and old tools that have been handed down to them uh, by folks in their family. And, um, you know, that can be a very meaningful thing. Um, if you want to restore them, you know, you'll be able to make an object that has beauty, uh, and value that you can hand down to your kids. Uh, and I mean, some of these tools were so beautifully made that you can get you know another century of use out of them by just giving them a little TLC right now. Hey guys, if you found value in this video, I hope you'll consider partnering with the channel to help us bring more videos, better videos, more knives, more techniques, all that cool stuff. Click the link to Patreon to help this channel. Also, if you haven't subscribed yet, bro, what are you waiting on? And check me out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Also, if you're into Japanese swords, check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you'll see more of my work and where you'll find videos about the making of Japanese swords, along with mounting, fittings, polishing, hamones, all kinds of good stuff. Now, more videos.